So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled Feminist Writing. So we're looking at Jhumpa Lahiri's short story, A Temporary Matter. We have already started with this text and we've sort of gone to a certain extent into the narrative and we talked about how the stylistic features of Lahiri's writing uh, informs the content of the writing in terms of looking at the meticulous details which are foregrounded, the, the objects, the ordinary objects which are foregrounded in a way that it connects with the broader, uh, more existential and more experiential uh, you know, narratives inside the story. Uh, so the furniture, for instance, the spaces, for instance, the little details such as the kitchenware, uh, the fridge, the refrigerator, the, the vehicle, the cars, all these little objects, these ordinary domestic objects, they become symbolic in quality while still retaining uh, the ob object status. So that's the very interesting balance that Lahiri creates in a fiction where objects become symbolic as well as remaining objects in their own right. Uh, and of course, the whole point is uh, to connect to the broader existential narrative. So how do objects relate to the psychological situatedness of the characters at any given point of time? Uh, so for instance, when you talk about, you know, that, that little experience of, of, of Shukuma finding himself dwarfed in a station wagon despite his six feet height, uh, and then, you know, imagining the, a position in time, a point of time later where he will have to buy a station wagon, where he'll drive his family to different excursions, different activities. So that becomes, the car then becomes a little capsule of hope. A uh, little capsule of uh, possibilities, uh, pleasant, positive possibilities, which are imagined in Shukumar's mind at any given point of time. And of course, uh, the car still remains the car, as well as becoming a vehicle which is symbolic in quality. And you can say that about uh, many objects in the story. Uh, the bare refrigerator, for instance, where just, just a calendar, uh, and that too is sort of a, not a very used calendar. There's no, nothing else in the, in, the, in the refrigerator at all. Uh, so the bare quality of the refrigerator, the minimalist quality of the refrigerator is indicative uh, of the psychological situation, the situatedness, the location of the house, which is one of blankness uh, and numbness uh, for this massive absence which has been produced by the dead child. So, you know, this story uh, is very, very important because, you know, the way, and the reason why we're looking at the story from a perspective of feminist writings is because we are seeing a female character uh, undergoing a transition uh, which is experiential of course and which is emerging out of an experience of loss. Now you can connect this in a very interesting way to Silver Plus tulips uh, because even there we find an experience of loss uh, emanating from a medical space or an experience in the medical space and how that informs uh, the character's situatedness, mental and psychological situatedness at any given point of time. Uh, and that too is very graphic and that too is very, very uh, symbolic in quality and a similar kind of a narrative design is used in this story as well. Now, as a result of which uh, the domestic spaces become very symbolic in quality. So for instance, the point in which we ended the last lecture where uh, Shukuma had created this, this nursery for the child, the arrival of the child. So there was a nursery with you know, wallpapers and different kinds of uh, children's toys and swings and uh, little gadgets a child would play with. And that of course had to be tragically disassembled when, when the child was born dead, when the child did not appear. Uh, and that was a devastating loss, a devastating tragedy, a human tragedy. Uh, and that, of course, immediately informs the spatial uh, narrative, the spatial design of the house, which was redesigned almost dramatically and very tragically. And that was converted uh, into his Shukumar's study. That was converted into his desk. Now, interestingly, you find that that space, which is a space of absence, essentially, the, the nursery which, in which the child did not arrive, that absent space or the space of absence becomes Shukumar's study and he finds himself being completely unproductive in that space. So the unproductivity, uh, the academic unproductivity of Shukuma in that particular space may be seen as an extension, uh, an existential extension, if you will, of the absence of the child. So it's, it's a continuation of absence, it's a continuation of uh, non-productivity, it's a continuation of you know, that, that, that sense of blankness, that sense of numbness, which is created by you know, that particular space. And of course we see how uh, simple verbs are, are used in a very symbolic way in the story. Like, for instance, we are told that every evening uh, Shobha visits Shukuma in his study. Now, I've explained this, I've talked about this in the early lecture, but I'll still say it again. Uh, and that is the whole idea of visiting someone, it can also implies the distance between them, right? You can only visit someone that you're separated from by a physical distance. So, despite living in the same house, despite living, despite sharing the same house, they are like visitors to each other. 
And the word hotel had come once, the word visitor, the word guest uh, had come once. Uh, so all these words uh, can be connected together into forming a narrative uh, over here. Uh, and we're told that uh, Shobha feels as if she's living in a hotel. So it's not really a home for her anymore. Uh, and you know, the whole idea of disintegration that we see uh, in the story disintegration and communication, the crisis in communication, the, the entire lapse of communication, the fall in communication, all that sort of emanates from the absent child, uh, all that emanates from the uh, non-arrival of the child, the dead child, so the deadness of the child becomes uh, a brooding spectral presence in the story and that sort of informs all the other absences which are operated in the story at any given point of time. So we, we see, and the point we will start off today, we'll see how the candlelight dinner uh, that the two people will share from this point of time. I mean, it becomes a compulsion, it becomes a necessary activity. It's not really a romantic activity. It becomes a necessary activity because of the power cuts which are happening because of some repair work going on in that neighborhood. Uh, so as a result of the power cut, there'll be an you know, a, a, a interruption in power supply from eight to nine every evening, This, which is the time they have the dinner. Uh, and so the candlelight dinner becomes, uh, you know, the whole idea of the whole stereotypical idea around the candlelight dinner uh, becomes problematized, uh, gets reconfigured quite dramatically. And now we see at this point of time um, how, you know, the whole idea of power cut is very, very uh, sort of special in quality as well because we, we, we are about to be told uh, the experience of power cuts in Calcutta uh, when Shukuma had experienced it you know, as a child growing up in Calcutta. Uh, you know, and it's something I can relate to personally as well. And that idea of power cuts in Calcutta, which is about you know heat and mosquitoes and uh, the whole you know the whole inconvenience of having this massive power cut for a massive amount of time, uh, is contrasted with the power cut over here, where people are informed in advance. Uh, this is just going to be a one-hour interruption in power supply. Uh, and but that at some point in time we find the contrast becomes also a connect, and that's something we find a lot in diasporic fiction where things which are seemingly contrasting with each other, seemingly uh, completely opposites of each other, they become uh, sort of ontological uh, extensions of each other. So, you know, it becomes a very interesting continuation. So opposites become uh, continuations, contrasts become connects uh, in the psychological situatedness of the diasporic imagination. So we'll see how that happens in the story as we move on. So Shukuma returned to the kitchen and began to open the drawers. He tried to locate a candle among the scissors, the egg beaters and the whisks, the mortar and pestle he brought in a bazaar in Calcutta, and used to pound garlic cloves and cardamom pots back when she used to cook. So, uh, you know, we find the objects in a drawer are important because we find this whole idea of mortar and pestle which is a very traditional Bengali, uh, you know, utensil for grounding spices. That's something which is there, uh, and which is something which is bought in a bazaar in Calcutta, uh, and that finds itself in the drawer in Boston in, in the U.S. So again, the whole idea, the whole metonymic idea of objects, um, you know, little metonymic objects which travel across time, travel across spaces, that becomes very interesting in the diasporic imagination because that is the way in which the diasporic imagination connects or keeps connecting back to the past, in a way which is uh, very, very existential and experiential and quality. He found a flashlight, but no batteries, and a half-empty box of birthday candles. Again, very symbolic, a half-empty box of birthday candles. Uh, seems to suggest that there'd be no further birthdays, and this is like a half-empty box. It's not a full empty box, uh, whereby you need to buy a new empty box, right? So you don't, you don't need to buy uh, a new box of birthday candles, because the previous box is half-empty, uh, and that's just going to stay like this, and that has stayed like this for a while. Again, the liminal quality is very, very important in the story. We talked about how the season becomes an extension or a symbolic uh, projection of the liminality. Uh, it's March and it's beginning uh, to become warm. It's beginning to become less cold. Uh, winter is about to go away. But at the same time, we find the remnants of snow uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, there are still stretches of snow, lines of snow in the neighborhood, which is suggestive of the fact that it's, the winter is still there as some kind of a spectral presence. And one can look at this spectral presence of winter uh, in connection to the spectral presence of the dead child in the story. That it, it just refuses to go. It just stays there as a brooding spectral presence throughout the narrative. Uh, we find that similar. Again, this is something which happens a lot in, uh, in certain kinds of fiction where uh, the exterior, the external season, external landscape, the external projected landscape out there, uh, it becomes very interestingly dialogic 
uh, with the uh, mindscape of the characters, the imagination of the characters in a way. Okay, so that's a very important connect that, and that, that Lahiri keeps making throughout the story. So the half-empty box of Buddha candles becomes an important uh, symbolic uh, material, metonymic material there. Shoba had thrown him a surprise birthday party last May. 120 people had crammed into the house. All the friends and the friends of friends, they now systematically avoided, right? So again, the, the contrast is very, very stark. So uh, you know, Shoba had thrown a surprise birthday party for Shukuma last May. And 120 people were there in the house. Again, uh, the, the house was populated with people. The house was populated by friends and friends of friends. Uh, so it was all about warmth and festivities and happiness and, and, uh, and all kinds of uh, and possibilities and hope uh, because Shobha was pregnant with a child. So they were looking forward to possibilities. They were looking forward uh, with optimism uh, to the arrival of the child, etc. Uh, and friends and friends of friends. And then we are told that these are people they now systematically avoid. Right? They sort of cut themselves off completely from those people and they find themselves, I mean, they have um, alienated themselves quite systematically, quite deliberately uh, post the tragedy of child loss. Bottles of Veno Verde had nested in the bed of ice in the bathtub. Shobha was in her fifth month drinking ginger ale from a martini glass. So, you know, again, little details are so important in Lyra's fiction. Uh, Shoba was in her fifth month, so obviously she couldn't drink alcohol, but she was drinking off a martini glass when she was drinking ginger ale. Uh, and then, of course, she had made vanilla, vanilla cream cake with custard and sponge sugar. All night, she kept Shukumar's long fingers linked with hers as it walked among the guests at the party. So uh, it becomes an image of perfect uh, connection, perfect uh, you know, you know, festivity, perfect happiness, perfect warmth. Uh, perfect intimacy. So, you know, this whole idea of keeping her fingers uh, linked with Sukumar's fingers as it walked uh, you know, through the guests in the party all evening, uh, the little fingers connected together, little fingers curled up together, that becomes uh, a very symbolic image uh, of intimacy, warmth, uh, love, romance, and, and connect. And that obviously, uh, the point of this information that, that Lahiri is giving us is that there's, there's a complete contrast to the dramatic disconnect they have uh, at this present point of time, uh, where they barely talk to each other, they barely um, you know, make eye contact, they barely know each other, they become strangers to each other completely, right? So that that uh, the constant flashback in time, the constant flashbacks in time, where we have images of fertility, fecundity, festivity, you know, happiness, intimacy, warmth, uh, all that is dramatically done, deliberately done, and contrasted with you know the different images uh, that, uh, you know, and, and the present that correspond to the present, images of, you know, bare existence, images of minimalist existence, images of disintegration, images of crisis in communication, images of estrangement, alienation, etc. So, you know, that image of Sh Shobha being in a fifth month, in a pregnant in a fifth month, walking with Shukumar with her fingers into uh, Shukumar's hands, into Shukumar's fingers, walking through a crowd of people who have just come to celebrate and wish them well, 120 people, that becomes a perfect image of happiness, a perfect image of pleasant possibilities, pleasant positive possibilities, uh, which is what they, uh, is a complete contrast to what they experience now as an estranged couple. And let me give in a sentence which serves to dramatize the contrast, and that is, since September, the only guest had been Shobha's mother. She came from Arizona and stayed with them for two months after Shoba returned from the hospital. She could cook dinner every night, drove herself to the supermarket, washed the clothes, put them away. She was a religious woman. She set up a small shrine, a framed picture of a lavender-faced goddess and a plate of marigold petals on the bedside table in the guest room and prayed twice a day for healthy grandchildren in the future. She was polite to Shukuma without being friendly. She folded his sweaters with an expertise he, she had learned from a job in a department store. She replaced a missing button on, her, on his winter coat and knit them on a, a beige and brown scarf, presenting it to him without the least bit of ceremony, as if it had, on, it had only dropped it. He had only dropped it and hadn't noticed. She never talked to him about Shoba once when he mentioned the baby's dead. She looked up from the knitting and said, but you weren't even there. And that's another very um, important feature in Lahiri's fiction. Uh, characters who are seemingly peripheral, uh, they just come in and they convey a lot, they, they, they communicate a lot. So we have an example of Shoba's mother over here. 
Uh, we're told that she is super efficient, that she had spent a good deal of her life working in a departmental store. Uh, so she knows exactly what to do in terms of household chores. Uh, she's deeply religious. She set up a shrine in a part of the house and she prays for healthy grandchildren in, in the future. Uh, and we're also told that um, um, you know, she will take care of everything. I mean, she'll drive to the supermarket, do the laundry, put all the clothes to dry. And she notices the smallest details. Uh, you know, she notices missing buttons and sugar mask uh, in a coat. Uh, and then she replaces them with an energy and efficiency, which is remarkable. However, despite all this, you know, despite all that superficial efficiency and you know, you know, this massive skill set that she has in terms of doing household chores, we are also told that you know, there's a complete gap in communication between her and Shukuma because you know, the only time in which uh, he mentioned the baby's death to her, when Shukuma mentioned the baby's death to her, she looked out from her knitting and told him point blank, but he went even there. Right, so this obviously carries a lot of accusation. This carries a lot of, it's, it rings with accusation. It's very deep and deep-seated uh, and a grievance ac accusation, etc. But that doesn't stop her from her efficiency. It doesn't stop her from her uh, uh, domestic duties uh, as the mother-in-law in the house. And that, that, that character becomes a very important uh, presence in the story because that character is an extension perhaps in anticipation in a certain way of the imminent collapse in communication that they're about to experience as couples, right? Uh, and, you know, the insertion of the character is important because, you know, despite being peripheral, despite being seemingly non-central to the narrative, uh, she conveys, uh, and she seems to anticipate in a way, you know, or she embodies the anticipation uh, of the crisis of communication between these two people because we just told right in the paragraph before this, they had a perfect relationship, they had a perfect marriage, they cared for each other, they loved each other, uh, they were preparing for a life of togetherness with the arrival of a child, and all that had been destroyed in the blink of a second with the, arrival, with, with the child being born dead. Uh, and then of course everything seems to collapse and disintegrate after that. So you can do an interesting contrast of this, uh, not a contrast, but a comparison uh, between this and what happens in Captain Mansfield's short story The Fly, which we covered at some point in this course with the sudden death of the boss's son, uh, which essentially collapses everything, which collapses the entire machinery of the boss, uh, in a way. Uh, and you know, that, 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 something, that is something which begins to disintegrate the boss experientially and existentially. Uh, and we have a similar kind of experiential and existential disintegration happening in the story over here. So that, that, that peripheral character, that seemingly unimportant character, uh, Shoba's mother, Shukma's mother-in-law, comes in and goes away from the narrative, but then she, she conveys a lot in terms of efficiency, domesticity, uh, superficial politeness, uh, but lack of warmth, lack of any genuine human connect, and of course a deep-seated regret, a deep-seated accusation, a deep-seated grievance uh, against the son-in-law for not being there when the child was about to be born. And now we come back to the, we cut back to the present. It struck him as odd that there were no real candles in the house, that Shoba hadn't prepared for such an ordinary emergency. He looked now for something to put the birdie candles in and settled on the soil of a potted ivy that normally sat on the window sill over the sink. Even though the plant was inches from the tap, the soil was so dry that he had to water it first before the candles would stand straight. So again, the dry soil of the uh, potted ivy becomes uh, a symbolic uh, material for the dryness, and the, you know, the, the warmth which is dried up uh, in this house. And he had to wet the, uh, the soil uh, for a while before he could make the candles stick to it or sink in it. Now again, the lack of candles in the house is quite symbolic, uh, which is obviously uh, in, in a very archetypal way. Uh, if you look at the candle as an archetype, uh, a symbol of, uh, of you know, an archetypal symbol, it will be a symbol of light a symbol of uh, illumination, and that is so sort of missing in this house. The only candles present in the house are birthday candles, and that's an important symbol over here. Uh, so he had to water it first before the candles would stand straight. He pushed aside the things on the kitchen table, the piles of mails, uh, mail, the unread library books. He remembered the first meals there when they were so thrilled to be married, uh, to be living together in the same house at last that they would just reach for each other foolishly, more eager to make love than to eat. So again, uh, this constant cutting back to the past of romance and, you know, and, and love and fulfillment and desire uh, and excitement uh, is used uh, deliberately just to cut back in the present and see the complete opposite of that, uh, which is something experiencing at the moment, which is a complete estrangement from each other. He put down two embroidered uh, place mats, a wedding gift from uncle in Lucknow, and set out, set out the place and, and wine glasses, the usually uh, safe for guests. 
He put the ivy in the middle, the white-edged star-shaped leaves girded by ten little candles. He switched on the digital clock radio and turned it to a jazz station, right? So, you know, it, it becomes, so if you look at it ordinarily, it becomes an experience of, uh, you know, it becomes a symbol of romance, a symbol of, uh, you know, a romantic dinner with, you know, candlelight and a jazz radio uh, and a little, you know, plant beside, uh, on, on a window, window sill. And of course, the food on the table and it all becomes uh, wine glasses, which are usually safe for guests. So again, this is very symbolic. They're having wine glasses uh, you know, on the table, which are meant for guests. So it's like two guests uh, cooking a dinner together in the house. So that becomes a very hotel-like existence again, right? So he switches on the digital. He switched on the digital studio uh, clock radio, and turned it to a jazz station. What's all this? Shoba said when he came downstairs. Her hair was wrapped in a thick white towel. He uh, she undid the towel and draped it over a chair allowing her chair, damp and dark, to fall across the back. Uh, as she walked absently towards the stove, she took out a few tangles with her fingers. Uh, she wore a clean pair of sweatpants, a t-shirt and an old flannel robe. Her stomach was flat again, her waist narrow before the flare of her hips, the belt of the robe tied in a floppy knot. So again, these very small details obviously are suggestive of uh, her post-pregnancy situatedness. And the stomach was flat again, the waist narrow before the flare of her hips, uh, the belt of the robe tied in a floppy knot. So again, very, very careful details. And also what she's wearing, a clean pair of sweatpants, a t-shirt and an old flannel robe. And she comes back from the uh, bath and then she's uh, seemingly surprised uh, looking at this uh, little setup that Shukuma had done. It was nearly eight. Shukuma put the rice on the table and the lentils from the night before into the microwave oven, punching the numbers on the timer. You met Roman Josh, uh, Shoba observed, looking to the glass lid and the bright paprika stew. So it was about to turn eight. Uh, so Shukuma is warming up the food because the light would go out at eight. Uh, and then, you know, Shoba observes that Shukuma had made, made Roman Josh with some sort of a preparation of lamb curry, uh, looking to the glass lid and the bright paprika stew. Shukuma took out a piece of lamb, pinching it quickly between his fingers so as not to scold himself. He, he prodded a larger piece with a serving spoon to make sure the meat slipped easily from the bone. It's ready, he announced. The microwave just uh, beeped when the lights went out and the music disappeared. Right? So the microwave went out because the power went out. The music disappeared because the power uh, went out again. And Shoba said, perfect timing. So in a perfect timing obviously means that everything is prepared now and now they, they can eat and it becomes uh, very convenient for them in terms of uh, having the meal. All I could find were birthday candles. He lit up the ivy, keeping the rest of the candles and a book of matches by his plate. It doesn't matter, she said, running a finger along the stem of a wine glass. It looks lovely. So you know, it, becomes, it begins to become uh, very symbolic. It begins to become happy again. It begins to uh, sort of arrive at a certain kind of happiness. Uh, you know, she's holding a wine glass. Uh, she seems to be relaxing a little bit, uh, and then you know they have candles, and you know, and he says to her that they, all he could find were birdie candles, and she tells him that it looks lovely. So it all becomes, it seems to nice, seems to become nice and happy in a way, which was missing for a long period of time in this house. In the dimness, he he knew how she sat, a bit forward in her chair, ankles crossed against the lowest rung, left elbow on the table. During, this, during a search for the candles, Shukuma had found a bottle of wine in a crate he had thought was empty. Uh, he clamped the bottle between his knees while it turned in the corkscrew. He worried about spilling, so he picked up his glasses and held them close to his lap while he filled them. To serve themselves, stirring the rice with the forks, squinting as they extracted bay leaves and cloves from the stew. Every few minutes, Shukuma lit a few more birdie candles and drove them into the soil of the pot. So it becomes a, a meal of happiness. It looks like it has a material of happiness around it. There's wine, there's wine glasses, there's you know, well-made lamb curry, and it has birdie candles along with it. And again, you know, this whole idea of having two adults having a meal uh, out of birdie candles becomes a very symbolic kind of image if you think about it uh, deeply, because these birdie candles were used on Shukumar's last birthday, right? And everything stopped after that. Uh, it was interrupted after that. The happiness was interrupted after that with the disappearance of the child, or the non-arrival of the child. And now that same box of birdie candles were used uh, to light up this dinner. Uh, and that becomes, in a way, a continuation, a quasi-continuation, if you will, of the happiness which was there at that point in time. So it becomes, the fact that it's using a material from that happy past to continue into the present becomes a bit of a symbolic narrative, in a way. 
uh, again, the spatial temporal setting is very important. It becomes a temporal continuation of that past in a way. Uh, and of course, the space is important because it's the same house, but then it's a dark house now. It's not really a birthday party where you can put that light, put out the light at will and bring it back again. It's, it's a house where lights have gone out for one hour and it will go out uh, every day for the next five days for one hour. Uh, and, and the birthday candles become a very important uh, symbolic presence in this kind of a setting. It's like India, Shova said, watching them tend his makeshift candle bra. Sometimes the uh, current disappears for hours at a stretch. I once had to attend an entire rice ceremony in the dark. The baby just cried and cried. It must have been so hot. So, you know, they're talking about domestic things, they're talking about little things. Um, Shobha talks about, you know, what is it is like in India. And she, she narrates an experience where uh, the power went out for a stretch of time, for hours and hours, and there was a rice ceremony where the baby uh, is given rice for the first time, which is sort of symbolically giving the baby uh, solid food for the first time. Yeah, and she says that the candle, the power was off, uh, it was presumably summer, uh, it was very hot. Uh, and then the baby just cried and cried. So, you know, they talk about a baby and a rice ceremony, and that becomes again a very symbolic um, kind of signifier. And the baby that it never had uh, keeps coming back in this narrative, keeps coming back in the experience. And we are told uh, immediately after that their baby never cried. Shukumar considered. So, you know, the complete contrast is done over here with the mention of their baby who never cried. Uh, and this reference to a baby who kept crying in the rice ceremony is interesting because, as I mentioned, that the baby keeps arriving in the narrative, the baby keeps arriving at the conversation uh, despite the non-arrival, it, it keeps arriving as a spectral presence and we are told immediately that their baby never cried, Shukumar considered, their baby would never have a rice ceremony even though Shoba had already met a guest list, decided in which of her three brothers she was going to ask to feed the child his first taste of solid food at six months, if it was a boy, seven it was a girl. So all these little rituals, uh, these very Bengali rituals of rice ceremony where the uncle, uh, the maternal uncle is the one who comes and feeds the baby for the first time, the first solid food, uh, uh, if, uh, six months if it's a boy and seven months if it's a girl. That's the ritual, temporally speaking. And we are told that Shoba had already met a guest list and Shoba had already uh, decided uh, who among her three brothers she will ask to feed the baby for the first time. So all these little decisions have been done. All these little uh, lists have been made, and that is important because then that tells you something about the um, character of the person, the, the meticulous attention to details, the care about little things that she has as a person. And then we cut back uh, into the present. Are you hot? He asked her. He pushed a blazing ivy pot to the other end of the table, closer to the piles of books and mail, making it even more difficult for them to see each other. He was suddenly irritated that he couldn't go upstairs and sit in front of the computer. So again, notice the way in which they're habituated uh, to sort of in, in avoiding each other. So, you know, he tells her, are you hot? And then pushes the candle away just so they can become more invisible to each other. And then he finds himself getting irritated, uh, the fact that he can't actually go and escape into the study uh, and then, you know, not talk to her. Because, you know, that has become a ritual that has become a habit in him, uh, you know, over the, over the period of time that they have been avoiding each other. No, it's delicious, uh, she said, tapping her plate with a fork. It really is. He refilled the wine in a glass. She thanked him. They weren't like this before. So again, this has become obviously very formal and stiff, uh, where the husband's asking the wife that is the food too hot, and the wife is saying this is delicious, and he, uh, you know, she thanks him, etc. And that become, uh, becomes a very formal exchange of conversation, which is not something which you find in truly intimate uh, settings, where you don't thank people so much. And this becomes more of a polite, formal, stiff conversation, where they're, uh, where they're trying uh, to talk to each other. Uh, and this attempt to talk to each other becomes very visible, very palpably present uh, in the story. Uh, we're told that it, they weren't like this before. Now he had to struggle to say something that interested her, something that made her look up from the plate or uh, from her proofreading files. Eventually, he gave up trying to amuse her. He learned not to mind the silences. So, you know, it becomes uh, increasingly, you know, large stretches of silence, really. Uh, and then, of course, uh, those silences become habits, those silences become uh, a regular ritual in the house. And then he gives up uh, trying to sort of get over the silences, trying to, you know, you know, move away from the silences, trying to make conversations across the silences. Silences consume the conversations in a way which becomes a ritual in this house. Um, and then, of course, they talk about other things over here. I remember during Paul failures at my grandmother's house, we all had to say something, Shoba continued. He could barely see her face. 
but from a tone he knew uh, her eyes were narrowed as you try to focus on a distant object. It was a habit of hers. So a distant object over here becomes a piece of memory uh, that she's trying to focus on at some point in the past. And she says over here, excuse me, she says over here that you know, during the pulkets in the grandmother's house, presumably in Calcutta, uh, they would have to uh, play a game where they have to say something, you know, uh, a little poem, a joke, we're told, uh, uh, to bring a narrative, to produce, to generate a narrative, which is shared by all these uh, fellow sufferers of pulket. And that's something, again, where one can relate to as uh, people growing up in 90s Calcutta, or even before Cal uh, that in Calcutta, where we have entire days of Pawakad, where people invent little games and rituals uh, to amuse themselves with, where there's no power at all. And then uh, Shukuma asked him, like what? I don't know, a little poem, a joke, a fact about the world. For some reason, my relatives always wanted me to tell them the names of my friends in America. I don't know what information was so interesting to them. The last time I saw my aunt, uh, she asked after four girls, I went to elementary school within Tuscan. I barely remember them now. So interestingly, she says that, you know, when I was a kid and every time I went back to Calcutta, uh, they wanted to know the names of my American friends. And then she said that, you know, um, last time when I was there, obviously as an adult, uh, many, many years later, my aunt was asking after those four girls uh, that she went to elementary school. So they remember them, uh, but she doesn't. So she said, I better remember them. But then to them, uh, it's, it becomes a big object, it becomes a big uh, you know, matter of memory in a way. So, uh, and that becomes um, uh, an important uh, point over here because, you know, what is being said over here is that to the Indian people, to the Indian relatives situated in Calcutta, uh, America becomes uh, an object of fascinating foreignness. Uh, and that fascinating foreignness uh, manifests itself in terms of names of American children, in terms of names of pe places, people, food. Uh, and that is sort of etched in the memory in a way which is very different from the way that she remembers it. Because to her, in growing up in America, it is like, you know, a, a very, very ordinary thing. But that ordinariness becomes extraordinary uh, to the people in India, in, in Calcutta. And then we are told, uh, Shukumar hadn't spent as much time in India as Shoba had. His parents, who settled in New Hampshire, used to go back without him. The first time he had gone as an infant, he had nearly died of amoebic dysentery. So he had a very terrible experience of dysentery as a child. His father, a nervous type, was afraid to take him again in case something were to happen and left him with his aunt and uncle in Concord. As a teenager, he preferred sailing camp with scooping ice cream during the summers to going to Calcutta. It wasn't until his, after his father died in his last year of college that the country began to interest him, and he studied his history from Coe's books as if it were any other subject. He wished now that he had his own childhood story of India. So this is interesting because Shukumar's experience of India is very textual in quality. We are told that she, he has gathered information about India from textbooks, uh, not experientially, but textually. Uh, and whereas Shobha obviously has more experiential uh, episodes from India where she's actually gone and visited and has stories to tell. And we're told that Shukumar wishes that he had his own story, uh, uh, own childhood stories of India. So what we see over here is, and I'll conclude the lecture at this point, what we see over here is two people who are attempting, trying very hard to make a conversation, a striking conversation, uh, are trying to produce a ludic narrative. Uh, and what do I mean by ludic narrative? It means a playful narrative. Ludic is play, playful. So they're trying to play a game uh, to cover the darkness, to cover the distance between them. And that darkness, that distance obviously becomes a very pervading, pervasive presence in them. Uh, and they're trying to make a peripheral conversation through a game, uh, through some kind of a ludic activity. And that's something which we find. Uh, and they're drawing on some experiences in Calcutta where people had to live with stretches of time without any power at all, where they would invent games and rituals, where they would interact with each other. And you know, obviously that was darkness in a way, that is the darkness of a power cut. Now, the darkness over here is not so much because of the power cut, it's the darkness because of the distance between them. And they're trying to cover the distance, they're trying to get rid of the distance, they're trying to sort of get around the distance uh, by uh, using a playful, a ludic activity. That's something which we see as the story progresses. So I'll stop at this point today and we'll conclude and hopefully uh, continue and conclude this, uh, this story in the next few lectures to come. Thank you for your attention.